Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Now, today's topic is how to break up with your phone. That's right, how to break up with your phone. I'm so very excited about today's show because my special guest is Katherine Price. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Katherine Price is an award-winning journalist and best-selling author of How to Break Up with Your Phone, The 30-Day Plan to Take Back Your Life. Her work has been featured in The Best American Science Writing, The New York Times, Popular Science, The Washington Post Magazine, and The LA Times. Her previous book was Vitamania, How Vitamins Revolutionize the Way We Think About Food. Catherine, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Thank you very much for having me. So, um, full disclosure here, I feel a bit handicapped when it comes to today's podcast because I actually do not own a cell phone. Whoa, you don't have one at all? No. Huh. So you're just like landline, Dr. Kerry <laughs> landline, Dr. Kerry <laughs> landline. So like I'm I'm literally one of the very tiny percentage of people on the face of the planet as we know it that doesn't have a cell phone. Well, I mean, this makes me want to interview you for this for this episode. Oh, well, we <laughs> that's <could> very <laughs> interesting. You don't even have a flip phone. You're like straight up wired. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right. So wait, I do need to ask you like okay. um, why and what do you say to people who say, how can you possibly do that in today's world? Oh, okay. So first of all, I don't have children. Okay. It's just my husband and myself, and um, we work five minutes away. We work actually right next door to each other, and so we know where we're at. And oh. I also really value my privacy, and that if somebody needs to get in touch with me, whether it's a family member or a patient... They know how to get in touch with me. And if they can't, it's because I want to be left alone. <laughs> that seems so you know? reasonable. It's either like I'm at the home or I'm at my office. And if you can't reach me there, then that's because I'm on my downtime. I see. And so you just like make plans ahead of time and stick to them. That's right. The old wow. fashioned way. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that is very, I mean, yes, I, I respect that. So, Catherine, I originally saw you on CBS This Morning. Um, now, that was back in um, March or April is when that aired. And I, I saw you um, speaking about your book. And I was like, oh, I really have to get her on my podcast because I think all of this technology is having huge effects on our health, whether we realize it or not. Yes, I completely agree. And, and I think that we're slowly beginning to become more aware that there might be downsides to the time that we're spending on our phones, that they're not just neutral or fun technologies. So can you talk about um, why is it important for us to reevaluate our relationship with our phones? And, and really, is it just our phones or this includes tablets, which I also don't have, or a laptop, which I also don't have. I'm so old school. Wait, how way. are we actually doing this interview? Is this actually by like... I'm on a, de I'm like on a desktop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, like, yeah. but I know a, a lot of my patients have these things, you know, they talk about, um, you know, being, um, sitting in their bed at night, you know, on their tablet or, you know, on their phone and, and, um, or on their laptop and, and how... So then I'm wondering, well, wow, that, that's not good for your health. The blue light, the stress. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we're talking about constant connectivity um, via devices. Uh, there, this, researchers actually have a word for this. It's uh, <laughs> wireless-enabled mobile devices, which the, the acronym for which is WMD. So right now, phones and tablets are the most obvious examples of this, but I think, and, and laptops, but they're going to be more of them in the future. Uh, but for right now, I think the biggest issues are the, are the phones and the laptops. I'm sorry, phones and the tablets, because they're so portable, especially phones. We carry them with us at all times. We keep them in our pockets. We bring them to the bathroom with us. I mean, they're constantly with us. And I think it's very important that we start to think about our relationships with these devices more critically um, and for the first time in many cases for many reasons, but one is just the amount of time we're spending on them. So there's this time tracking app that I like called Moment uh, that works for Apple devices. There's one called Quality Time that's uh, good for Android. And I got in touch with the guy who made this app and I asked him, well, what's the average amount of time people are spending on their phones every day? And he told me that he has more than 4.8 million users, so quite a large sample size. And the average person is spending three hours and 57 minutes a day on their screen. Um, so almost four hours, which is a sixth of your life. And I asked him, well, okay, well, does that count like, you know, listening to music or, or what about the times when you're, um, engaging with your phone, but the screen is off. And he said, well, no, it actually doesn't count that time. It is just the time when the screen is on. So that means in reality, the time is even higher and that the statistic is even more disturbing. Yeah, because so people have multiple devices. You've got multiple devices, but also if you're spending four hours a day wow. just with the screen on, but then you're also talking on the phone for 45 minutes, I think talking on the phone is fine, but that's another 45 minutes. And then you're listening to podcasts and music for another hour. So you start to realize, oh, no, the four hours is literally staring at the screen, which I think is the most concerning part wow. of what we do with our phones. Yeah. Holy cow. Yes. Okay. And so then um, I I'm sure these manufacturers make us addicted to these things too. Well, if you start thinking about the, the business models and incentives behind phones and apps, then a lot of this becomes uh, much easier to understand. So, for phone makers, they want us to be on the phones because they sell the phones and they make money off of, of their phones and they want them to be as appealing as possible. So that explains why they're so, you know, lovely to use. Like there's bright colors and they're very smooth and aesthetically pleasing. And that makes total sense. And it's probably not something most of us would want to trade in because it, it makes it an enjoyable experience. Um, the good part about that is that well, let me get to that in a minute. I'll get to good parts in a minute. The the other category of apps or companies to really think about are app makers. And they have a different business model from phone makers. Phone makers want to sell the phones. The app makers want to keep us on the apps for as long as possible. And in many cases, that's because the apps are... Um, are supported by advertising. So anytime an app is free, you should be asking yourself, how are they making money? And if it's free, it's because they're making money off of you. And this is becoming more and more um, increasingly common knowledge with some of the privacy issues that have come up in recent months. But basically, if an app is making money off of you, then it's going to want to get you to be on the app for as long as possible, because that's how it collects data about you, and that's how it shows you advertising. So apps in particular are designed to keep us on them for as long as possible and therefore use a lot of elements that are also common in things like slot machines um, and devices that are known to be and designed to be addictive. And the reason I said good news is that now that there is a bit more awareness of this, um, phone companies are in a bit of a different position from app makers in that since phone makers make money off of selling the phones but don't necessarily need to keep you on them for lots of times, they actually might have an incentive because of public outcry to want to make some changes in their products to make them uh, align better with our own users' interests. And I can talk more about that in general, but um, that's an overview. So there's the creepiness factor of how these um, businesses and corporations are taking um – taking our information and using it and following us and whatnot. And well, it, it, it's funny to think about it as creepy when you think we're all doing this voluntarily, right? Like right. people sign up for a Facebook yeah. and then you, you're the one posting all the information. You're the one mm -hmm. liking your friend's photos and sharing this information. And what I think a lot of people just haven't realized until relatively recently is that Facebook is holding onto that information and then using it to help target ads uh, and make money off of advertising. So, I mean, if you go to Facebook's homepage, they actually have a thing underneath the sign-up form that says it's free and always will be. Right. Well, it was recently valued uh, summer of 2017 at over $500 billion, and that makes absolutely no sense if, you, if you're if you actually what's 
what uh, the customers if you're the customer, but you're not. You're just, it's free because your your attention is being sold. So apart from the creepiness factor that we are voluntarily letting happen, what about the effects of all of this on our brain and and well, that aspect? Yeah, so there. I think that that to me is. The mo- I mean, I'm disturbed by the information part just in the sense that you don't know what is eventually going to happen with this data. It's one thing to just use it for advertising, but I find it creepy to have one company have such a repository of information on every citizen, um, plus the fact they combine it in, in many cases with offline data sets, um, so they really have crazily detailed profiles in people. But for me personally, since I don't use social media very much, the bigger concern is what all this time that we're spending, what this four hours a day is doing to our brains. And I think that's something that um, should concern people because our brains are incredibly plastic, meaning they're constantly changing. And that makes total sense if you think about the fact that you can learn new things, like that's your brain changing. And when you spend four hours a day doing anything, you're going to get pretty good at doing whatever that thing is. I mean, I like to say, like, if I actually studied Spanish for four hours a day, I'd get pretty good at Spanish. (laughs) I'd be able to achieve that goal of speaking Spanish very quickly. But when we're on our phones, we're not really pursuing any one particular thing. I mean, I talk about it as a very, very intensely focused state of distraction, meaning that we're not aware of anything else in the world around us when we're on our phones. That's why people, like, walk into poles and drive into things when they're on their phones. But we're also not focused on anything in particular on the phone. We're, we're swiping between apps or even within an app. We're looking at different emails, different social media posts. We're constantly skittering around the surface of things. Um, so that's just one issue is that we're just constantly distracting ourselves. But we can also talk more about specific ways phones are affecting us. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that, the specifics. Okay. So, I mean, in terms of focus... And, and, and by the way, I mean, uh, Dr. Carey, you mentioned a term when we were speaking before that I had not heard, but I think is really applicable, the digital dementia, which is, I guess, a catch-all term for some of these effects that all this phone time and screen time is having on us. And one of those effects is the um, that it impacts our ability to stay focused. So if you think about it, the human brain actually is not designed to stay focused because that would make absolutely no sense evolutionarily. I mean, if you are really focused and then you don't notice uh, on, say, a rock, <laughs> and then you don't notice there's a rustle in the grass and there's a tiger there, you are not going to last very long. So our brains are actually um, evolutionarily primed to be very distractible. And that means that when you build up the ability to concentrate, you're actually fighting against your brain's nature. Uh, The act of reading is actually an incredible achievement. It's highly unnatural for our brains because you have to decipher meaning out of these symbols and you have to focus on that. And most importantly, you have to ignore everything else. That's an aspect of concentration we tend not to really think about. It's not just picking what to concentrate on. It's the ability to ignore every single other stimulus in your environment. So reading actually helps us build this skill and it, it takes a lot of mental effort. When you're on your phone, you're actually doing the opposite. You are training your brain to go back to this default state of distraction. And it's very similar to exercise. It's a lot easier to sit on the couch and let your muscles atrophy than it is to go to the gym and get in shape. And so we're essentially letting ourselves drift back to this kind of couch potato brain state where we're constantly distracted by things and we lose our ability to maintain our focus on things for long periods of time. Yeah, and that's where this term digital dementia, which is actually now a real medical term, is coming... Well, it's just starting to be explored because these effects are literally changing our brains. So like you said, if we're a couch potato, our muscles are going to atrophy. Well, those areas of your brain that you're not using, like like we used to use, you know, like I still remember my phone number from when I was a kid. And I think most people do. Right. But, but I think if you ask most people now, like, what what's your phone number or what's your cell number? They don't know because they don't. They just open their phone and they like pass it on. Right. Or certainly for your, like, best friend's phone number. Like, I don't know my best friend's phone number. Yeah. I know my best friend's phone number from when I was a kid. Six yeah. to eight, when, you know, <laughs> I can, like, yeah. recite it for you. Oh. But I don't know. Or my great aunt's, eight eight six eight six nine. Like, I can't tell you what my best friend today, what her phone number is. And, and then the other was, um, you know, so many people are attached to their GPS that they don't think about um, the directions and how to get from A to B. And, and so those areas of your brain, if they're not getting stimulated – are starting to atrophy, literally. Right. I mean, you do, your brain does change. The, the most famous um, 
example of that is the study that was done on London cab drivers who have to memorize all of the streets and landmarks in London, which is an incredibly difficult task. It's the test is actually just called the knowledge. And apparently it still happens, even though there's GPS now. But when these researchers did scans of uh, people who had studied and passed study for and passed the knowledge versus people who had not done that test. They found changes in the posterior hippocampus, which is an area that related to spatial memory and reasoning. And so there actually were physical changes in these people's brains as a result of what they had studied. And so you can extrapolate from that that, I mean, if you're spending lots of time doing any one particular thing, you're causing changes in the circuitry and in the physical structure of your brain in ways that will you know, increase one skill, but uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good skill and it might be at the expense of something else. And there, are there any other impacts um, on our brain with when it comes to these um, relationships we have with our devices? I mean, there's lots of effects. There's a, another big one is memory. So uh, your working memory, that's your short-term memory, how much you can keep in your mind at one time, that's definitely overwhelmed by your phone. Um, there's a famous experiment or paper called the magic number plus or what is it magic number seven plus or minus two, which is basically the idea that we can't hold more than uh, five to nine things in our minds at any given moment, and that number has since been revised downward by many people to more like four. But that's why phone numbers are because we're becoming dumber, <laughs> right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think we're just. <laughs> I think we tend to have a bit of a hubristic view of like how much we could actually, our brains could do. And now we're recognizing our limitations maybe a bit more. But the idea being it's very, very easy to overload your working memory. Um, and when you have that overload, then you have a lot of difficulty making decisions because your brain is just overwhelmed. You tend to default back to this um, uh, older areas of the brain that, that are very distractible and impulsive. And you can't, this is an obvious but interesting to think about, you obviously can't have a long-term memory if it didn't start as a short-term memory. Right. So if you're preventing yourself from really uh, consolidating short-term memories and, and experiencing things in general, I mean, if you're staring at your phone all the time, you're actually not experiencing life, so you don't have anything to remember to begin with, uh, you're going to impact your ability to get it to long-term storage. And in terms of long-term memories, it's particularly interesting because they actually um, require the creation of new f proteins to solidify as opposed to just strengthening connections between neurons. And that process of creating the new proteins is affected by things like distraction. So you're actually creating a, a you're impacting your brain's ability to create the physical changes necessary to solidify memories. And what's more, uh, people tend to think about long-term memories as being like a file cabinet or a hard drive on a computer that you can just pick one out at random and put it back in. That's not how it appears to work. It appears that they're actually stored in, in networks of connected memories called schemae. And, um, any one memory could have connections to any number of other memories, which is why the, this, the thought of one thing can so easily lead to thoughts of other things. Uh, the example I use in the book is like if you think about a traffic cone that, and an orange, they're both the color orange, so they are connected by color. Um, and then an orange would be connected to a lemon because they're both citrus fruit. And so an orange is connected to lemons and traffic cones, kind of interesting, but traffic cones and lemons, unless you're pretty creative, are not directly connected. So you build up these like schema over years and it takes time and again, protein formation and um, space to create these networks. And the deeper your these, these schematic networks are, the better your capacity is to have insights and creative thought because your brain actually can jump between seemingly unconnected things and have insights. So when you are constantly overloading your working memory, you're impeding that in any number of ways from uh, allowing the short-term memory, sorry, gathering short-term memories to begin with, putting them into any kind of storage, and then creating these uh, connections between things. So that is to say that our phones are having a much more profound effect on us, or the time we spend on our phones, in that they are getting in the way of actually creating the structures necessary for us to have creative and uh, insightful thoughts. Okay, so we have um, the average Joe, they're on their phone or their tablet. Um, it's creating these brain changes. They start having, and, and I have these kind of patients walk into my office all the time, and, and uh, they have complaints of a foggy brain, poor focus, poor concentration. Their short-term memory is not as sharp as it used to be. They're not able to read and retain the information like used, they, they used to be able to. And, and then from a medical standpoint, I, I start thinking, well, this is possibly early cognitive decline is what this is. And, um, and so then what are some of the things that people can do to start changing their behaviors on how they use their phones and their tablets and whatnot? 
Yeah, so that's the, as you know, the point of my book, How to Break Up with Your Phone, was to the first half is called The Wake Up, and it's all about the, st- the, the potential negative effects that our phones are having on, on memory and sleep and focus and stress and satisfaction and relationships, all this stuff. And then the second half is a 30-day plan designed to actually help people regain some of the things that you're talking about. So, I mean, I would say, in a nutshell, that that I think it makes sense to go for the most obvious culprit first and see if it makes a difference. You know, it's like if someone's in a murder trial and they've got like bloody hands, you'd probably start talking to them or at a crime scene before you talk to someone with clean clothes. And uh, there's been interesting work done in children by psychiatrists where some kids who have been diagnosed with ADHD or or have tendencies along that line actually greatly um, improved, if not the symptoms entirely alleviated by doing a fast from screens. Like it appears that some people are just more sensitive to the effects of screen time than others. So my first suggestion would be to, to focus in on your screens. If you feel these things are happening to you, maybe install a time tracking app and see how much time you're spending on your phone to see, or your tablets to see how long you're actually exposing yourself to these things. And then maybe, I mean, I would suggest trying to go through my plan, but, but I would suggest that people, you know, take a step back and, um, evaluate how much time they're spending on them and then start to build in some attention building practices to their daily life. So take, we can talk about this in more detail, but start to take structured breaks from their devices without trying to go cold Turkey. I don't think that's necessary for most people, but then also trying to build attention building practices. For example, set a timer for 10 minutes for yourself, put your phone in another room and then just actually read a book or a magazine article and you're going to feel your brain want to be distracted because we have all trained ourselves to want to do that. That's that twitchy feeling of being unable to concentrate and you just notice when that happens and be with it. Don't try to fight it. Just notice it and then go back to reading until it happens again and you have your phone in the other room so that you can't automatically reach for it and, and try to do this every day for a week and slowly build up. And I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say that we should prescribe 10 minutes of reading a day to help people's brains, but I actually do think that that is a good place to start and that it actually can have effects because I've certainly seen that happen for myself. My, my ability to concentrate is much better than it was when I first started uh, working on this project. And then do you have any other tips for our listeners out there of things that they can start thinking about changing or implementing? I have lots of tips. So the book is all about, um, you know, a holistic, broad plan for how to really make a change in your life. Because it's not, when you really try to change a behavior um, that's as ingrained and constant as checking your phone, you can't just, for example, switch your phone to grayscale and think that it's going to solve your problem. So one of my biggest pieces of advice is that people take a step back and ask themselves why they are trying to change their relationship with their phone. And instead of, you can't just say, I want to spend less time on my phone, because that's not, there's no goal in there, and it also feels punitive. So it's not about spending less time on your phone, it's about spending more time on your life. And it's about um, giving yourself, taking time back from your phone so you can spend that time and attention on something else that brings you more meaning and joy. So one of the first steps I encourage people to do is to ask themselves the question of what does bring you meaning and joy, and how is your phone getting in the way? And the reason I think that's a good place to start is it gives a philosophical framework to the project that um, actually helps increase people's personal motivation so that they continue on the path towards change because of an intrinsic desire to do so rather than feeling like uh, they're on a diet or they're somehow uh, punishing themselves. So one of the things I think is most useful, and this is backed up by evidence, is to, um, is to cultivate an ability to pay attention to your actions in the moment and decide if you want to be doing what you're doing, which is really just a way of describing mindfulness. And um, there's a great study that was done by a, a doctor named Judson Brewer who is now at the University of Massachusetts Center for Mindfulness, and he wanted to see if he could use this kind of awareness training to help people quit smoking, which seems kind of like a crazy thing. Like, why would just um, paying attention to your actions in the moment help you quit smoking, especially compared to the American Lung Association's gold standard treatment, which is what he was comparing it to. It turned out that after his intervention, the um, mindfulness people quit at twice the rate of the other group and that their long-term success rate was closer to five times as high. And the point being that if you actually start to pay attention to what you're doing in the moment and how it makes you feel and, and whether or not it's something you want to be doing, it becomes a lot easier to change. And in the case of phones, that means like learning how to begin to catch yourself right when you're having a phone craving and asking yourself, do I want to indulge in this craving right now? What would happen if I just observed that craving and didn't give into it, didn't really fight against it, but just let it ride out because it will end? Or 
when you're on your phone asking yourself, is what I'm doing on my phone making me happy right now? Do I want to be on my phone right now? Just checking in with yourself in a non-judgmental way. So if the answer is yes, I do want to be, or yes, it is making me happy, or it's not making me happy, but I have to do it anyway, that's fine. But the point is that you've given yourself this exit ramp so that if you were doing it unconsciously or if you realize, oh, it's making you feel bad, you've now given yourself this chance to change direction. So, Catherine, that's really interesting about the smoking. So are you saying then that as people go through this 30-day program of breaking up with their phone, can these be can these behavior changes um, impact other areas of their lives? Yes, definitely. I'm glad that 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 came through because that was one of my hopes in writing this book. Um, I actually was inspired in part by the life-changing magic of tidying up. I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with that, but it's the Japanese art of decluttering by a woman named Marie Kondo. And it's this book that essentially tidying up means throwing out everything you own or giving it away. And she makes these ridiculous claims in the beginning of the book that's like tidying up will make you lose weight and make you a happier person and uh, help you find a, a partner and all this stuff that you're like, oh my God, this is just funny. But you go through the book and it actually does make you feel better. I mean, it had a profound impact on my kind of feeling of like emotional lightness and just really made me feel uh, good in ways I never would have anticipated. And that is what I found to be true with the phone as well, is that the phone can turn into this, it can it can transform from a problem that's impacting all these areas of your life and your brain function to a catalyst for very positive change that goes way beyond just the phone. Because once you start, you use the phone as a tool to cultivate this sense of self-awareness, well, then you start to have the ability to do that same kind of check-in regardless of whether a phone in the middle of an argument with someone and think to yourself, do I really want to be having this argument right now? Or do I really want to react in the way I'm about to react? And you know what? No, I don't. And again, you've given yourself an off-ramp to, to do something else. And that is very profound. It can change people's relationships. It can change their stress levels and their happiness. Um, it's an extremely powerful thing to learn to do. And uh, in that way, I almost feel like you know, having a bad relationship with your phone could be considered a gift because you have the chance to change it and then to use the process of that change to really improve other areas of your your life. And then can you comment on how effective this program is? Well, I guess, of course, it depends on how you define effectiveness. Um, I don't normally de- define it as objective in like minutes you spend on your phone per day. And I say that just because it, it's all about what you're actually doing with those minutes and whether you want to be using it for those minutes. I mean, if you're spending seven hours a day on your phone, then perhaps we could agree that you would be beneficial to cut that down, um, regardless of how fun those minutes are. But for a lot of people where they've cut it down a lot, so it's maybe an hour or so a day, then I think it's more about, okay, well, when you use your phone, how do you feel about it? How do you feel while you're using it? And how do you feel after you use it? And also, what's the opportunity cost of this time you're spending on your phone? And how do you feel about that? So for a lot of people, when they start, it's like, I keep finding my phone in my hand. I don't know how it got there. 45 minutes have passed. I don't know what happened to those minutes. I go to sleep with it. I wake up in the middle of the night and check it. And then for success in those cases might be getting the phone out of the bedroom so that you're sleeping better. You know, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is it depends on what your initial problem is that you're presenting with just in the same way as with any medical condition. So if your problem is you're not sleeping well and then you get your phone out of your bedroom and you find that, oh, okay, with the reduction in blue light before bed and the reduction of um, notifications and things, I'm sleeping better, then you've succeeded. You know what I mean? Yeah, so basically any step in a in the positive direction <clears throat> is good and, and then yeah. that depends on what, what your goals are anyways. Exactly. Yeah. I guess I'm saying it's it's like a personalized thing. So for some for one person it might their goal might be I know I really do want to just reduce the amount of time because it's so much time and I just want to see what it would be like to get that time back. And then for another person it might be more specific. I feel like I'm not present with my kids and so I want to spend less time on my phone or spend less time on whatever apps so that I can be more, more present with my kid or you know I want to regain my ability to concentrate. So everyone's goals and thus um, measures of success can be different. So, Catherine, we're running low on time. You've given us a lot of great information. Is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you think is important to share? Lots. Okay. <laughs> it's been a wonderful <laughs> conversation, but it's just, it's so interesting to me that, like, it's just this subject has so many different things to talk about. 
for us to talk about both in terms of what our phone time is doing to us, but also um, how changing our relationships with our phones can help us learn how to change behaviors in general. So I really uh, hope people will check out the book, How to Break Up with Your Phone. But um, one thing that does come to mind immediately is is something I think is often uh, missing when we try to change behaviors. We'll try to remove a negative activity without realizing that that's going to lead to a vacuum <laughs> and right. unless you give yourself right. an alternative then you're going to go back to that that activity you're trying to avoid so an easy example is checking your phone before bed okay the obvious solution get your phone out of your bedroom charge it out of your bedroom and get a standalone alarm clock those are both very important things to do but if you have not figured out what you want to be doing in those 15 minutes before bedtime then you and giving yourself an easy way to do that thing, you're gonna that phone's coming right back in in like two days from now. It's gonna be back in your bedroom. So you need to think, okay, well, what do I want to do? And if you say, well, I want to read more or I want to build up my attention by reading, then get a book that you want to read or a magazine and then put that back on put that on your bedside table. So the point being to remove the negative trigger, but also add a positive trigger so that you give yourself something else to do. And that is really essential in any kind of behavior change and something that I think is often overlooked. Catherine, how can our listeners find out more about you and where can they grab a copy of your book? Well, uh, they can learn about me and the book at phonebreakup.com. And I hope they'll check it out because I've put a lot of free resources on there, including lock screen downloads that you can use on your screen that are images that say things like, what do you want to pay attention to? Or do you really want to pick me up right now that people can use to kind of start to um, develop this ability to check in with themselves? And there's lots of recommendations for um, apps that can help you or books and organizations, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, they can, my personal site is Catherine price.com, but I think it's probably easier to get to me through the book's website and you can buy it uh, online or hopefully in your local bookstore. And if it's not in your local bookstore, please request it because I would really, I think it's a very important subject and I'd love for it to be as you know, available to as many people as possible. So for the listeners out there, I'll make sure that all of those resources and links are in our podcast notes so that you can um, easily find Catherine, her website, all of her great information, and of course, a copy of her book. Catherine, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been an awesome interview. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Katherine Price. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next time for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.